Welcome back to the Booty Bands More Than Fitness Podcast. I'm your host, Danita Young. Today, we're going to learn that change is possible at any age. It truly is never too late. I have a special guest. Her name is Susan Nyberl, and she's an online strength coach with a passion for helping people change their lives by showing them that it's never too late to really feel better, move, lose fat, and build strength and muscle. She's 63 years old, and she made every mistake in the book and was able to turn it all around in her mid-50s. And her goal is to now help empower other women to do the same. So I'm going to welcome her into the call today. Let's get started. Booty Bands and Barbells helps busy women sculpt and tone their bodies in just 15 minutes a day through our physical products and our one-on-one coaching. Commonly what we hear is a a blaming of menopause that now the belly's bigger. And so being able to have women identify what that is and being able to find ways to get around that, is there there steps that you do for that? Or what are ways that you help women through the belly and, and menopause? Well, I, I think w- women need to understand that um, it's a normal process, right? We, it, But it's going to hit us all differently, but we almost all get a little bit of extra belly fat because that's where our hormones want to store everything during the time. Um, but the first thing is we got to understand that we're still in control over this. It doesn't mean that we can't lose weight. And I think that's the first step because we think automatically we can't because what we did when we were in our 20s doesn't work anymore. Well, it's not going to work anymore because we're not in our 20s anymore. So, yeah, we have to be tighter. We have to be a little bit more on top of things, a lot more on top of things. We don't maybe have the wiggle room that we used to give ourselves 20, 30 years ago. But with all of that, we still control the narrative. We still control how it goes. And and I think people give up too quickly. Um, And if people would take a modest deficit approach, which – for people in my generation, that's kind of hard to do because we're programmed to think that we have to starve. We're programmed to think that that's the only way to get rid of this belly fat. And that's not true. A modest deficit with consistent effort. And I, I, I'll even say this, consistent, honest effort over time will get rid of whatever belly fat, whether it's belly fat or arm fat or you know, whatever fat, you know, I mean, it, it's, that's the formula for anything at any age. It's just when we get to this time of life, yeah, it's more challenging. It's probably going to take longer and it's going to be frustrating, but we have to be more vigilant about it. I think it's probably a, a good word, but the cool thing is it will still work. I mean, the science of weight loss hasn't changed just because you're in menopause, you eat less than your body needs, you'll lose weight. But now we've got to be a little bit more on top of that piece, you know, maybe tracking our calories when we didn't before, maybe weighing our food when we didn't before, maybe not having all the snacks and the mindless eating that we did before, you know, things like that we have to be more aware of and more on top of and then be consistent with all of that over time. Got it. So for, for me and my take on it with helping women too, is I try to as as least as possible think of doing the calorie counting or the deficits or the restrictions in any sort of way. If anything, I like to, and the the shrinking mentality, in my opinion, has actually made people not even know what is left to write. They feel very confused. So mine is giving them one thing to focus on. And what I've seen working with women that are over the age of 30s or at least 40s and up is that they are protein deficient because they have been starving themselves. So I give them one thing to focus on, which is get protein in every one of your meals. And that alone, just that alone helps build back that muscle, which gets them back into eating consistently, and then also speeds the metabolism, which burns the fat. So that's kind of my approach. So you're kind of saying, you were saying like deficit and and calorie counting and and to me, I feel like that would, that would throw me overboard. Does, but does that work for you? And does that work for your clients? It could work for whoever. I mean, it doesn't, it may not work for everybody, right? I mean, if someone is brand new to this, and that sounds overwhelming to them, well, then it's not for them, right? I mean, focusing on protein is a great thing to focus on. So is, okay, let's not track everything. Let's take a piece of paper and write down everything you put in your mouth during the course of a day. And let's kind of get an idea, an honest awareness of how much you're actually consuming. You know, I, I, I think that's pretty easy. You don't have to count anything or measure anything because we always think we're eating a lot less than we actually are, Right. And yeah. when we write it on a piece of paper, we our eyes get wide open. It's like, oh my God, I didn't know I was actually eating and drinking all of this all day long. 
So when, when you start getting that kind of an idea, you could start making small changes just from that list. You know, maybe I'm not going to have the snack. I don't need this. I don't, you know, and then that, that could be one way of getting the ball rolling. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to do this. That's one of them. Protein certainly can be one of them. It, it's not a one size fit, fits all, but the awareness of you are in control. You still need to consume less than your body needs. Let's figure out what works best for you. Yeah. Um, I like the awareness piece. I do believe that in order to change anything, you have to have awareness. So I do think that's a very important part. I think where most of the overeating comes from, at least with my side of this world and working with women, which obviously has got to be very similar. But for me, what I see is emotional eating, the stress eating, the boredom eating, you know, those type of eatings is kind of usually what comes into play first. So even though, yeah, they can be tracking it, but oftentimes there's kind of more of a psychological aspect to this. So how do you approach that if somebody's just bored, stress, or emotionally eating? I think they need to become aware that they're being, a, you know, they're, they're eating mindlessly. And a good way to do that is I tell people, okay, you find yourself in the kitchen, you're just going for that bag of chips, you're putting your hand in there because it's just, you're just passing by, right? It's not even on your mind. So I like to tell everybody a, a cool strategy for this, and it can work for emotional eating as well, is when you feel that impulse to grab something, which is emotional eating or mindless eating, stop, just stop for a second. And I, I say, ask yourself if you're hungry, just get yourself out of the subconscious and now make it conscious. And of course the answer is probably no, because when we do this kind of stuff, we're rarely, if ever, truly hungry. Um, it's something else that's driving it. But what asking ourselves does is kind of like it wakes us up. It's like, oh, wait a minute. No, I'm not hungry. And then, okay, from that moment on, you're now making a conscious decision. You're deciding to have whatever it is. Okay, allow yourself to have it. Take some of it out of the bag, put it on a plate, sit down and have it. Don't sit there and take the bag with you and keep eating. Or maybe you're going to say, you know what? I don't really need this right now. You're going to turn around and walk away either way. And, and, and with that, you can also say, you know what, I'm going to set my timer on my watch for like 20 minutes. And after 20 minutes, if I still want those cookies that are in, in the bag, I'm going to go and allow myself to have some cookies from that bag. I'm going to pick out some again, put it on a plate again, sit down and have them. But after you put some time and distance between the, the impulse of that, you're probably going to find that it, the impulse isn't there or at least it's not nearly as strong. And then when you allow yourself to have something as opposed to you're eating out of a bag and you're telling yourself while you're doing it, I shouldn't be doing this, I shouldn't be doing this, this is bad, 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 blah, 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 blah. That's now out of the equation. You're allowing yourself to have it. It has a completely different light to it. it makes a, It makes a significant difference. Yeah, I like that. I like the, that's definitely our approach over here too, is the allowing yourself, which is the balance rather than the extremes of you can't have it, or you can have, you know, th that to me, I find that middle ground of give yeah. yourself that one or two so that you no longer live in this, like, yes or no, the extremes of on and off starting stopping type of experience. That's one of our biggest things that we kind of full blown more into that balance for, for us. I'm, so my question, um, I truly think that an action comes a little bit deeper. An action always comes from a feeling or an emotion that comes from a, a belief system that usually comes from a trigger. And so our process is we kind of work through that process to understand, okay, well, you're emotional eating, but where is that really coming from? And what they'll find is that is from an event that happened in their life that they're creating a belief of I'm not worthy, I'm not lovable, I'm not enough, which then creates a feeling of hopelessness or giving up on myself or depression or what have you. And that's when we see the eating um, is stemming from that. So the immediate gratification they, gra they gravitate towards. So for us, we go a little bit deeper, but what, what's your thoughts on that as far as those emotions or the boredom and stress usually comes from a deeper place? I, I would agree. A lot of it does. I don't know if it does all the time, but I think it does very often. Yeah. And sometimes the deeper place, that's where a coach is I mean, a line has to be drawn at some point, depending on how deep we're talking about, because it can get deep to the point where this is a therapist thing. This is not a strength coach trying to help you lose weight or, or whatever. 
I think you have to recognize that I'm a former school counselor. So I'm trained in stuff like this. I recognize when it's really not my scope and when I can really recommend for someone to work on some other issues outside of what we do. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to understand where those lines are. And it's the lines are going to be different depending on the scenario, obviously. Um, I think for, for situations that are within our scope, I like to set people up with short term success. So they start believing in themselves. Their self-efficacy is probably in the toilet. You know, it, it just stems from, I never can do anything. I never can stick with anything. This is what I always do, blah, blah, blah. It's the same old chatter, chatter, chatter. And to to get through that piece, you have to set people up with just like one thing at a time, small stepping stones to success so they can feel good about what they're doing. They can feel like, yes, I can do this. Um, and then maybe get really good with that one thing and then add another thing. You have it stack. You know, in other words, you start with one thing, then it becomes two things over time. And maybe it's three things. I will say that's not an approach for everyone. A lot of people get really bored with that really fast, depending on their backgrounds. You know, some people want to try to dive in and let's go. But a lot of people would benefit greatly from this habit stacking of one thing for an extended period of time, the other thing so they can start feeling success, because that's where things are going to change when they start believing that they can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously you look a little older, um, but you look really freaking strong over there. So for those that are older women that are trying to get more of that sculpted toned look, are you saying leaning towards cardio? Are you saying that starving method? Like what truly got you some amazing arms today? Well, I'm 63 by the way. So yeah, I'm, I'm a lot older. <laughs> yeah. Um, strength training, strength training is Every single person should be doing some kind of strength training. Um, strength training will change how you look. It will obviously help maintain muscle mass and help build muscle mass. It's going to increase your bone density. It's going to improve your confidence. I mean, there, we could go on and on and on and on. And it is the key for a longer, healthier, functional life as you get older. So people who are 30 years younger than me, hopefully they're on it now. Because then when they're my age, they're going to be 10 million light years ahead of me, you know, and, and smooth sailing for, for the rest of the time, you know? Um, so I'm all about strength training two to four times a week. I'm also aware that a lot of people don't like it. You know, I happen to love it. So I have no problem going to the gym three, four times a week and lifting heavy. Um, but I know a lot of people don't like it. And I think strength training is so important for your health and longevity that even though if you don't like it, you really ought to try to do it at least a couple of days a week and then find what you do love, whether that's walking, whether that's a dance class, whether that's wh whatever it is, do that. Mm -hmm. Make sure that is fun, that you love that. But if you want to change your body, I'm talking about lifting heavy weight and heavy is relative to the person. What's heavy for me may not be heavy for somebody else and vice versa. So lifting heavy weight, pushing yourself, getting a little uncomfortable because weightlifting will get you a little uncomfortable. Um, build some muscle mass while you can, while you can still keep building and, and keep doing that for your health forever. It's that important. So I'm all about strength training. I am also not ignoring cardio. I think cardio is another very important piece, but so many people over the years have looked to cardio as doing it because they want to lose weight. They feel like cardio, I do it because I have to lose weight. And I think we need to separate the relationship with food and weight loss and everything here and understand that nutrition is going to drive the weight loss piece, training, whether it's cardio, lifting weights, dance, whatever it is, whatever you do for exercise, we do for our health. It's two separate things. And I don't like seeing people doing exercise to try to lose weight. Cardio is going to be great for your heart health. It's going to be great for your joints, great for your mental health. So I'm a huge proponent of, of getting some sort of daily movement cardio in every single day, not high intensity, low intensity cardio every single day. Your heart will love you forever for it. Yeah. Um, so as uh, a lot of women, I don't think fully understand that they're losing muscle mass. Um, what yeah. can you tell about women as they are getting older 
Uh, what age does it usually happen at? And do you know how much, what the percentage is of the, what they're losing? Yeah. I mean, starting probably around age 30, anywhere from five to 7% a year. I mean, it's, it, I mean, decade, sorry, five to 7% a decade. And while that doesn't sound maybe like a ton, it chips away at you very, very quickly. And what's interesting about that is you will arrive in middle age, I'm going to say maybe even in, in your fifties and kind of go, what has happened to me? You know, it's, it's just, it's, it's chipping away, eating away at you over time. But the cool thing is you can prevent every single bit of that, <laughs> every single bit of that. And if it's happened to you, you can reverse it. That's what's cool about lifting some heavy weight. You can reverse all of this has happened to you. Will you build muscle in your sixties? Like you did when you were in your thirties? No, you will not. But that doesn't mean you can't build some muscle while you're there. I mean, it, it's not an all or nothing thing, right? Um, so I think it's really important to understand that you've started losing muscle mass in your in your 30s at some point, and you're going to continue to lose it if you're not upping your protein and making sure you're getting enough protein and you're and you're lifting some heavy weight. You know, those two things will change the course of everything. That's what's really interesting about all of this. It really empowers the person. Right. I mean, it's empowering to know that we think we're victims of menopause and victims of getting older. And there's no, we're not victims. You know, we're, we're not victims. We still can control a lot of this. So I think that's a really important point to drive home. There's hope for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, well, I've done quite a lot of podcasts and one of them, we had a doctor in here and that they were actually uh, for physical therapy, they're actually taking the cardio machines out and actually starting to put resistance and strength training in. And, um, it's your, at your accuracy on what we're losing is correct. It could even be more depending on if people are starving themselves and missing out on the protein, or if they've been completely sedentary and haven't been using, utilizing your muscles. If you don't use it, you lose it. And so it's, it's very important. I think it does empower women is what you were saying there. And especially with, you know, this weight loss industry that's valued at $80 billion that has really had a lot of women stuck shrinking themselves. And so I like how you were talking about the empowerment part there of women being able to take control over their muscle, which is their metabolism. It's their fat burning ability to get that more desired look that they're looking for. So I, I agree with you. And so what age do you think you started lifting weights and starting to see the results happen for you? What was your story behind all that? Uh, mid fifties. That's um, it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Recently. Uh, I've been in a gym much longer than that. Okay. I mean, I've been in the gym for since, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, probably. I mean, I've been in the gym for a long time, but I, I started doing classes just like a lot of people, you know, they got me back in the door, started paying attention to the weight training session, decided to hire a trainer. And I'm talking, this was back in the night, early nineties, maybe late eighties. So I've been in the gym for a long time. I just never had anyone put the pieces of the entire puzzle together for me. Cause I lost about 50 pounds with Jenny Craig back in the day in the eighties, late eighties. Um, and after that, I didn't know how to maintain anything. I didn't learn anything from Jenny Craig other than I didn't eat a lot and I lost weight. And I carried that for decades. You know, I lost and regained increments of that 50 pounds over the decades. So I never had that combined with training at ever together until I was in my mid fifties. When I hired my coach, he changed my life. We're now business partners. We run the inner circle together, Jordan Syatt. He and I run the inner circle together and um, yeah, everything changed at that point, how I thought physically, how I looked. Um, yeah. And so now I feel like it's my mission and it's also my responsibility as someone in this industry, being as old as I am to let everybody know I am no one special. I don't have good genetics. Um, I have a lot of health issues on my, my, my side of the family that I have to fight all the time. It, it's hard work, but it's possible for anybody to change. I mean, I changed everything. I was 50, I started at 54 years old. I'm a different person now. So yeah, I mean, there's hope for anybody. Yeah. I love that because I think a lot of people have given up hope. So yeah. if somebody's listening right now and they have are at that place of hopeless and you said you kind of put the puzzle pieces together, what would be your best explanation of what that puzzle piece together is to now get you where you're at? I surrounded myself with the right people who were speaking the right language and arming me with the information 
that I needed to have, which I didn't have for 30 years prior to that, thinking I had to starve myself to lose weight. No, I didn't. <laughs> but going through life back then, that's what we were told. Mm -hmm. That's all we knew. So in my defense <laughs> back then, that's all I knew, right? Mm -hmm. Until I get into my 50s and I pair up with Jordan, who, who's making my head explode with, are you kidding me? I don't have to do that. I don't have to work out seven days a week hard. Oh, thank the Lord. You know, I mean, those changes, though, they don't happen like when you walk into a room and you flip the light switch on. That took time because we're talking decades and decades of beliefs in your head that don't go away that fast. Right. So it's chipping away at the mindset, chipping away at letting go, trusting the process. And once and, and being honest with myself being honest with my efforts before what I thought I was doing everything. And I wasn't even close to doing everything. Um, so much fear involved back then. If I didn't work out seven days a week, I was going to lose everything, you know? Um, and, but I told everyone, I just love working out, you know, and I did, but it was fear that was running my, the show. You know, my relationship with exercise stunk and I thought it was phenomenal because I loved it. So le relearning all of this, um, ha is something that took years to be honest. And, and I, I still get this, some familiar kicks in the gut. You know, if I see the scale go up, I still don't like it. I understand what's happening. I understand I didn't eat 10,000 calories over my maintenance in order to gain a pound overnight. I, I know that, but I still don't like it, you know? So I still have the little familiar pangs. I just know how to handle it now. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the cool thing, but it's so possible for everyone to experience this. Um, and I feel like I need to be one. I'm so, I'm so much older than everybody, most everybody. Um, and so I feel like I really want to kind of lead the way and, and make sure the message gets out that it's never too late to make a change. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's very needed because there's going to be people that are out there that if they think it could be an age is the reason why yeah. they're not right. Yeah. So they can use that yeah. for an example, but we know that there's a Joan, I think she's in her eighties now. Yeah. That, oh yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, she's a perfect example of, she started, I think in her seventies, if that's yeah. correct. And now she's in her eighties and she looks phenomenal. So being able to show women at any age that you're at, whatever your genetics are, whatever you're going through, a lot of it, we didn't have the right tools. And so I feel the exact same way as being able to be that voice for women, because I've been hopeful, I've hopeless, I've been stuck in depression, I thought that there was no way I could ever get to the goals that I wanted to, until I hired a coach. And then that yeah. changed my world. And I thought, yeah. man, why is this not out here in the world? Yeah, so I yeah, right. There's like minded women like you and I out there really spreading this message and um, really appreciate you coming on today. So what I'll do is um I will go ahead and put your Instagram down in the below that you guys can go ahead and uh check out Susan. She's phenomenal. You can already hear just that she's set in this path of hey, it's hopeful. Get out of your own way. We weren't taught this, you guys. So let's learn the new way. And yeah. there's more control. It's simpler. It is more possible. It's easier. You're in a more place of maintenance. You don't have to struggle anymore. That's all very possible. So thanks for jumping in today and taking your time. Is there anything else that you would like to say? No, I, I thanks for having me here. And uh, yeah, it's it's truly never too late to change. And I hope everyone takes that away. And if I can ever help anyone, please let me know. Absolutely. Thanks for jumping on, Susan. I appreciate sure. it. Thank you. And um, bye. So I have really never stuck with anything for more than six months until I found Booty Bands Barbell. It's life changing. The progress over perfection mindset has been so life changing. To have self love and to have self worth. I just do the 10 minutes and I'm already reaping the benefits. The workouts are fun and that they're effective. I have seen great results that I never thought I'd ever see. I love it because I'm keeping the weight off. We help hold each other accountable as they commit to our goals. Booty Bands and Barbells has really changed my life for the better. I have to be real with you. The past six months really took a toll on me and my body. I felt incredibly stressed, isolated. After being a good 12 to 13 pounds heavier, I said, that's it, I'm gonna make healthy choices. And I'm happy to tell you today that I am actually down 15 pounds. I feel amazing. I feel like I lost fat and put on muscle. I have a lot more energy. So it's never too late to start. You can take control again. Thanks, Booty Band Nation. Positive that you will get more sculpted, more toned, and you're gonna love those new healthy changes and our community and our coaches. From where you're at, no matter where you are, 
are or how long you've been in the position. So just click the button below to book the call with our team.